All right. If you have your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 with me this morning. And verse number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. And verse 1. 1 Corinthians 2 1, the church at Corinth. The apostle says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Yeah. Did you get that? He was well qualified to come in all the wisdom and speech of any country, any culture, set at the feet of Gamaliel. The Apostle Paul was an educated man. That's why God chose him so he could compare the Old Testament Scripture by revelation with what God had revealed to him about the New Testament Church of God. Father, bless your word now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. If you notice the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2 that I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Someone would say, well, now that's not all he talks about. I mean, after all, you've got two books here, First and Second Corinthians. If Jesus Christ and Him crucified is all that He talked about, then uh, we have a problem here. Well, folks, here's what He means by that. He said, to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ and Him crucified means that nothing in life, makes no difference what we cover, has any meaning at all except it be understood in the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the glass that we look through to examine and judge everything there is. The American government... My life, the world, history, science, whatever it is, we look at it through the lens or through the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, the Lord Jesus Christ crucified becomes the most important event on the face of the earth. And how does it relate, therefore, to what's happening? For example, in the book of First and Second Corinthians, the apostle talks about incest and fornication. Does that relate to the crucified Christ? Absolutely. How about the abuse of tongues and the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Certainly it does. What about the sectarianism that we find in the first and second chapters of 1 Corinthians? Oh, yes. The resurrection, does that relate to the crucified Christ? You better believe it. What about the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? Does that relate to the crucified Christ? Yes. What about the doctrine of repentance, where the apostle preached it in Corinthians about repentance? Yes, sir, it does. And then the hardship the apostle endured, what he went through as he dealt with the ministry here. Does it relate to the, to, to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Then the atonement, where the Bible said God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself. Does that relate to the gospel of Christ or to the cross or to the cross of the Lord Jesus? Yes, sir, it does. How about the spiritual warfare that we deal with, that we find in the book of Corinthians? Does that have any relevance to the crucified Lord Jesus? You better believe it does. Then the apostolic authority of the Apostle Paul, where they questioned his credentials. Then he said in Second Corinthians that I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body or out, I do not know. Does that relate to the crucified Christ? Oh, yes, it does. Everything, past, present, and future, invisible and visible, tangible and intangible, whether you understand it or don't understand it, it certainly does relate to the crucified Lord Jesus Christ. When the Bible says that He's Lord, that means He's Lord over all. Does the Bible say that He upholds all things by the word of His power? Absolutely. Does he hold it together? Yes. Does he give it meaning? Yes. Does he give it purpose? Yes. Do you have meaning in your life? You do if you know Christ. If you don't, you have no meaning. You're just here as a mindless robot, part of this new world order, as something to be spoon-fed and brainwashed into following along as the orders come down to you from the elite. But my friend, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you have a guide which is the Holy Bible. You have the Holy Ghost in you which is the unction of the Spirit. Therefore, you have a guide, a leader. You have an unction, an understanding. You have a worldview that is entirely different from what this world is pumping out into the minds of the people. So the apostle says, yes, to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. When you talk about this, you talk about the ministry. My friend, the Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians that the Bible says that it made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That's quite a thought. For the apostle looks at the element of sin, he looks at it from perspective, and he wants to build on that so you can understand what the Word of God has to say. Now, I know that that's an archaic word. I realize that word's not very popular. 
I believe there are churches in this town right here that you could go to for five years. Probably never hear the word sin mentioned one time. You hear a lot about yourself. You hear a lot about me, myself, and I. You'll hear a lot of uh, you'll hear a lot about exalting you, but you'll hear nothing about sin. But let me say this to you this morning: my problem and your problem is S I N. I need to know the remedy. I've already acknowledged that that's the problem. I have no doubt in my mind that sin is the problem. Therefore, the Bible defines it. It tells you of its origin. It tells you of its power, and it tells you of its ultimate place. Sin, therefore, is dealt with in Scripture, but it's dealt with not as a human being would deal with it, but as God reveals to us what sin is about. For example, when that man who was the publican that walked into the temple, and the Bible said he smote upon his breast, and would not as so much as lift up his head toward God, he said, God, be merciful to me, a drunkard. Am I wrong? Did I mess up? What did he say? A sinner. And if you'll note carefully what this man said, you begin to get an understanding of what the Lord Jesus was trying to say to the people there that day. When this man walked in there and smote his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, he did not pick out and choose any particular sin. And the reason he didn't is because he understood the concept of sin. He realized there's a whole lot more going on inside a human soul than simply one sin. Satan will have you focus on one sin. He will have you gain the victory over one sin. But the problem is that most of the time, a sin will mask a greater sin. Most of the time, the one thing that you think is your besetting sin is simply a symptom of a greater sin. And my friend, the Bible doesn't half-step. It doesn't back-step when it deals with the origin of sin and sin in its essence. And my friend, what it does to us as human beings. The Apostle Paul made it plain in the book of Romans chapter number 7 when he said that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. The word soma is used to translate body. The word sarx is used to translate body and old nature. The word pneuma is used to translate spirit and the word suke is used to translate Soul. So the, Old the New Testament breaks down the essence of a man into its parts. That you have a body, that you are a spirit, and that you have a soul. And it deals with every aspect of that in the New Testament. It gets into the nuances of it, into the depths of it, into all the perspectives of it. And that's a different message entirely to try to preach all about that. But I'm going to give you a point this morning to show you how that the Bible has the answer when the man smites upon his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, then God is merciful to the sinner. He didn't have to tell him what he'd done. He didn't have to break it down in particulars. It's not left up to you to define sin. It's not left up to you to pick it out and point, pinpoint every possible manifestation and application of it in your life. I don't believe a human being is capable of that. I don't believe a man of Adam's race is able to look into the human soul and to find every single particle, part, or perspective, or essence of sin. It's enough for us to understand that he that says he has no sin has a problem. It's good enough for me this morning to understand that there's a remedy for my sin. And I need to understand it in the light of the Bible. For the Bible breaks it down in a marvelous way when we look at the essence of sin. Every last one of us in this house today have sinned in this past week. Sometimes a sin in the Bible is not what you do. Sometimes in the Bible a sin is what you haven't done. Sometimes in the Bible a sin is a state of being that you allow yourself to get into. Sometimes in the Bible a sin has to do with the fact that you can't even pinpoint it, but you know there's something wrong in your life and that you need help. Have you ever been like that? Have you ever been in a situation where you prayed, you sought the face of God, you've looked upon Him, you've come to Him, and yet something just isn't right? And you don't know exactly at the time what it is, but what you need to do when it happens is to not give up, but to continually come to Him, to keep praying, 
to keep reading your Bible and maybe even to fast if that's what God puts upon your heart, but to do what God wants you to do, and that is to seek Him out, to draw nigh to God, and He'll draw nigh to you. You're entering into a spiritual world. A spiritual world is a world like walking into a forest. You can't see but so far. A spiritual world is a world where you're exploring because there's so much before you that you really don't understand. The spiritual world is a world that is not natural. It's not something that you have behind you and experience. It's something that you experience as you move along. And God gives us a guide in the Holy Bible. And that guide is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the witness to His Word. Put this down in your heart. Write it indelibly in your soul. The Holy Spirit of God will never contradict His written Word. The written Word of God is God's manifesto to humanity. It's God's revealed mind to you. It's God writing in stone what cannot be changed. The written Word of God is fixed, and it's fixed forever. And when I hold the Bible in my hand, I say, Lord, I may not understand it, but I believe it. I may not be able to apply all of it, but I certainly embrace it. I have in my hand your holy Word. Now, Lord, I will not be so arrogant. I will not be so proud. I will not be such an one as to say to you, I have mastered your Word. I may master every word in it and memorize it from cover to cover, but that does not mean for a moment that I have embraced it in my soul or even begun to understand it. There's a vast difference between the two. And so when the Lord Jesus Christ is said by John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. If you look carefully in the context, you'll find He didn't say He takes away the drunkards of the world. He didn't say He takes away the liars of the world. It said He taketh away the sin of the world. Sin in its concept as a whole unified thing. When I begin to think about sin as a unified thing in the concept of it, it puts an entirely different perspective upon it. For I must say, say to you, and I confess freely, that when it comes to the idea that sin is a unified whole, I certainly am smitten by it. I've been bitten by the bug. I've been infected with it. It affects me. There's something about it that has definitely taken root in me, that is in my old man, my old nature. That old man that never did get saved or was born again is still as rotten as it ever was and ever will be. And that's one of the things about the new birth. For the new birth in itself condemns the old man to damnation and to the earth from whence it came. The new birth lifts one part up to God, but it also exposes the other part. The new birth says, Lord, I love you. I want to serve you. You're my God. But that also says to that old man, you do have no part in him whatsoever. And from dust you are, and to dust you shall return. There is a part of me that glorifies God, a part of me that loves Him, a part of me that exalts Him, a part of me that rejoices in Him. And I say to you, friend, if you know Him, you know what I'm talking about. A part of me that says, God, I thank you that you saved my soul. But there's also a part of me that's enmity to God, a part of me that if I allow it to rule my life, that I will know, I know which direction I'm going to go. I will spiral downward. This is why time and time and time and time again, time and time and over and over in the New Testament, you are told to take that old man, to subject that old man, to put on the new man, to give him no place. There's a war that you must war between the new man and the old man. Now let's look at that new man for a moment and let's look at that Savior Christ Jesus. The Bible said in 2 Corinthians 5 that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. There is a vast difference between the revelation in the Old Testament of Almighty God and what happened there at Calvary when God was in Christ reconciling the world into himself. He made peace with man. He made peace with him. He reconciled him to himself. And now the Lord Jesus Christ has become the object of everything we're about. For when the Lord Jesus Christ became the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, and God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Our focus now is on the Son of the living God. It sure is. And if the Holy Spirit is energizing your life, giving you life, 
If you're drawing your life source from God and the only way you can do that is through the Holy Spirit, if that's happening for you, you can be assured of this, that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to get is, is going to have complete control of your thinking processes and the, and, and, the, and, the, and, and your mind and your life. It's awful quiet in here, and preachers love it when it gets quiet. Hey, I've preached when they're throwing babies up against the ceiling. They're running in and out the door. They're pecking on their phone. And you can be sure when that's happening, they ain't listening. But when it gets quiet like it has in here this morning, you're paying attention. Thank you very much. The two most prevalent and insidious sins are self-righteousness and pride. They're closely akin. These are the two things that plague all of us. These are the things that sometimes they make light of. These are the kind of things that they kind of, they just kind of sweep under the rug because neither one of them are sins that you can see committed physically by the flesh, although they are both the underlying cause of most sins, self-righteousness and pride. But the greater sin is not self-righteousness, and the greater sin is not pride. There is a sin that is greater than self-righteousness and pride. What's that, preacher? It is the sin as you relate to the Son of God. And nobody but the Holy Ghost and God can know exactly how you react in your heart and in your soul. Once you ever mature enough to the point to realize that it's not about stopping what you're doing. It's about accepting the one who did what you can't do about what you're doing. Did you get that? It's not about you quitting anything. It's about you accepting the one who can stop what you are doing in your heart and in your soul. You either receive that ever revelation or you reject it. Once you receive it, you begin to say to yourself, There is no doubt in my heart that the Lord loves me and that I need the one who went to the cross and there he died for me. I want you to look carefully at the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. In Christ is complete submission to God the Father, complete acknowledgement of His Lordship, absolute surrender to His will, complete dependence on the Father's care. When I look at the Lord Jesus Christ, I think to myself, why am I fighting? Why am I wrestling? Why am I trying to overcome and subdue a sin when God already did it in the Lord Jesus? It is up to me in my heart and in my soul to accept what He did, His work for me. But that's not easy to do because the heart of a man is full of pride and he's full of self-righteousness. Most of the hard preaching that you hear against sin is from somebody who probably has a greater sin that he uses to hide behind that preaching to cover up what he's doing. The human mind will trick you and fool you. It will play games with you. And my friend, it is so hard for a human being to understand when his mind is playing with him. You can condemn this and do something worse but justify what you're doing because God's got to be pleased with your preaching. That goes on in the pulpits all the time. That goes on in Christian lives all the time. And when that publican smote his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, he was saying, Lord, I don't understand all that goes on inside my soul. I don't understand all my weaknesses. And I know I come far short of what you expect of me. My God Almighty, the only thing I can plead is mercy. <clears throat> the more man begins to understand the depth of this war that we're fighting, this spiritual battle that rages in our soul, the more he'll cry for mercy. It'll drive you to your knees. You can judge your spiritual life by how much you're driven to your knees. I'm not talking about some ritual prayer that you have every day. I'm talking about a prayer that drives you to your knees. I'm talking about a prayer where you say in your heart, Oh, God, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. God, you say, Preacher, if you're praying every day, 
and you're living for the Lord, you can live above sin. No, you cannot. He that says he has no sin is a what? That's what he said in 1 John 1, and that applies to everybody of Adam's race. But the difference between an unsaved man and a saved man is this. The unsaved man has no indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Even if he acknowledges the weakness of his flesh and says to you, Oh yes, I'm a sinner. The unsaved man does no concept of the two natures. He has no warfare going on. That's simply a cliche he's using to get you off of him. But the born-again believer has a desire to serve God. And I want you to look at what happens when you get saved. In Christ, the sinner's remedy for sin. The Lord Jesus Christ becomes the remedy for sin. Now you say, well, a preacher, I believe in Jesus. I've accepted Jesus. Well, that's easy to say. And around here, everybody's accepted him and believed in him. Most people in East Tennessee, unless you are an agnostic or an atheist, you'll say that Jesus is the Son of God. And you'll say that you've believed in him and that you've been in church and you're a Christian. But that doesn't make you one. Say, I prayed the printer, sinner's prayer, preacher. That makes you a Christian. No, it doesn't. You say, what makes you a Christian? Nothing makes you a Christian. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. To accept Christ is to accept him as Savior. Then begin to acknowledge him as a high priest. And then focus your attention on him as Lord. Notice that to accept Christ is a threefold proposition. First of all, you accept him as your Savior. That's what got you out of sin. That's what got you out of the condemnation of sin. That's what got you out of damnation. At that moment that you accepted Jesus as your Savior, at that very moment, then your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. There is therefore now no more condemnation. There's no condemnation. That transferred you from a child of hell to a child of God. Thanks be unto God. Most Baptists think that finishes it. That just begun it. The moment you got saved was the start, not finish. That's the beginning, not the end. You say, preacher, I thought only saved once, saved, uh, uh, saved one time, that's it. Once saved, always saved. True. If you're born again, you're only born again one time. But you see, from the moment that you're born again, you need somebody to guide your life. You need power over sin. And you have no power over sin. The scripture that's quoted constantly, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. Who's in you? <laughs> if the Holy Ghost is in you, then He has a work to do. And here's the second aspect of your, of your battle with sin. A Savior delivers you from the condemnation of sin. A high priest delivers you from the power of sin. Think of it. When the Lord Jesus Christ ascended to the right hand of the Father, He sent the Holy Spirit. He said, He can't come till I go. And when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He'll guide you into all truth. Our battle is fought, not with flesh and blood. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but the might into God to the pulling down of strongholds. What does that preacher? Spiritual power. Where does spiritual power come from? The high priest intercession and his ministry at the right hand of the Father. Once you begin to grow in the Lord, dear Christian friend, the more you'll depend upon your high priest, who is the advocate with the Father, who's pleading into the ear of the Father, and who's ministering by grace into your life what you need to deal with sin. You see, the Savior was saved your soul and you were born again. The high priest saves your life so that a witness and testimony can come forth from you. That high priest ministry ministers grace to the hearer by the power of of the Holy Spirit of God. That's what 1 John chapter number 1 is dealing with. That's not getting you saved. 1 John chapter number 1 is not about you being born again. 
First John chapter number 1 is about your growth in the Lord, your walk in fellowship with God, your communion with God the Father and God the Son. And that communion is based entirely upon truth and light. And the only way that truth and light becomes a reality to the believer is by the power of Melchizedek, that Holy One, that is the High Priest at the right hand of God the Father that ministers these things to us. And the only way that becomes a reality to a believer is when you start coming into agreement with God. Instead of hiding behind your church teachings and your self-righteousness and your pride and throwing into the face of somebody, well, I don't do what they do, and I've never done that, and I don't do, I never do this, and I this, I that. Listen, sin is not fornication, adultery, lying, lasciviousness, and all the rest of it. Sin, as it's brought together in the Bible, is set in, in complete opposition to God. It's that element that is opposed to God. When Satan said, I will, I will, I will, I will, he was setting himself over against God. That's the essence of it. Look at the essence of that and what can spawn from it. Everything can come from that opposition to God. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Once you're born again, that high priest at the right hand of the Father gently, clearly works in the heart of a believer, pointing out those things that rise up in your soul, yea, they may be good. They may be even having a sense of, of, of an element of righteousness. But unless it is Jesus Christ, it's self-righteousness. And that becomes a dagger in your soul. A man can try to do the best he can on his way to hell. What do you do then, preacher? If you're walking in fellowship with the Lord, you're crying out daily, Jesus, I need more of you. If you're walking in fellowship with the Son of God and God the Father and God the Son, you're crying out, Lord Jesus, I'm hungry for you. Help me. Was all that in my heart? Was all that in my soul, Lord? It was there, Son, but I chose this point in time to let you know about it. There's more in there, but that's okay. We're going to have fellowship together. On down the road, I'll reveal it to you. And then when it comes up, and I bring it up as an issue, then confess it. Acknowledge my Lordship, which is the third step in your salvation. What's that? That is the Lordship of Christ has to do with Him delivering you from deceit. Deceit is the work of Satan. It has power as sin. How many of you this morning would agree with this preacher and acknowledge with me that sin is a deceitful thing? I've gotten to the point now I, I, I feel pretty bad for drug addicts. It took me a while to get there because you get mad when they steal from you. You get angry when you see what they'll do. But folks, there are drug addicts out there on that street right now. They've got to get a fix. And I've heard them say time and time again, I'll do anything I have to do, whatever I've got to do, rob, steal, kill, whatever, i got to get a fix. They are slaves, folks. They're pitiful. They're pitiful. And what happened? They were deceived. Somewhere when they were kids, some teenager came along. They were teenagers. Oh, man, let's have a cool time. You know, whatever they break out. Start with pot, move from pot. They call it a gateway drug. Pot opens the door to the rest of the stuff. And they go off into drugs. And when they go off into drugs, you go off into hell. You bring a living hell into your life. Your pride and your arrogance tells you, well, I can handle it. I can handle it. That's your pride. Notice carefully. Drug addiction's the problem, but the underlying real problem's pride. One sin masks another. But the real issue is not your pride. The real issue is the fact that you will not allow yourself to take the one who connected us to God, who took your place and removed the power of sin. He's the only answer for your sin and my sin, and that's Jesus. Amen. Son of God, not preacher lost, and I can't deliver you, couldn't deliver myself. I can't do anything. I'm as helpless as I can be. But he can. He can. 
He can. Well, I'll close with this. The Savior is yours at the new birth. The high priest is yours as you grow in grace and knowledge. The Lord becomes your focus in life, your goal, your future. The one who progressively separates you from the world unto him. That's growing in the Christian life. Nobody ever told me any of that when I got saved. They were good people. But they're going to take you so far. These are things that I've learned. Some of them I've learned on my knees. Some of them I've learned by getting burned real good. Sometimes I have to learn the hard way. Just get kicked real good a few times. And you'll start waking up. Amen. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I pray I've presented the blessed Savior. Lord, I pray that I've, I've presented the Lamb of God. God, I pray that somehow or another, Lord, this morning that I've put in the hearts of the people their great, great, great need to depend upon Jesus. To depend upon Him. Even if they don't feel like they have, if they don't feel like they need to, to depend upon Him. To cry out to Him. To receive Him. Receive Him every day. Receive Him in different ways than they've ever received Him before. Not to get them saved again. Lord, you know that. that's not what I'm talking about. But to grow in the salvation that they have. That they already have. In Jesus' name we pray. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. Let's stand up this morning and sing. Page 375 in your All-American. Would you come? I leave here this morning and say, when I preach your loss and said individual sins were okay and it's only the big concept of sins that's our problem. I didn't say that. That's not at all what I said. What I said was, let's go to the root of the matter and find out why you do what you do. It'll manifest itself in all these particular sins. But the original problem or the main problem is the root cause. You go to the doctor, you don't even put a Band-Aid on a cancer wound. You want him to go find out what's wrong. You want him to treat it. You want him to get to the root of it. Find out the problem. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't go to a doctor and him say, well, go home and take a couple of baby aspirin. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. When you're coughing up blood. <laughs> You'd find you another doctor, wouldn't you? That's exactly what's going on here. Your problem is not drunkenness. Your problem is not lying. Your problem is that your relationship with the Lamb of God is not right. And your relationship with the Lamb of God is never built on the way you think, although the way you think is very important. It's built upon the fact and truth of God's Word, illuminated by the Holy Spirit. If God said it's a reality, it's a reality, folks, whether you can wrap your mind around it or not. And the reality is, if you walk in the light as He is in the light, you have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. Walk in the light means to walk in agreement with God. And you walk in the light. And you have fellowship. And the fellowship causes you to grow. And as you grow, God gives you the ability to see sins like you've never seen them before. Amen. And then learn this, and I'll shut up. When you do something, don't wait five minutes. Don't wait an hour. Don't wait two hours. Do it right then. God, forgive me. Right now. Forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. Get it done right then. Right then. Right then. And then go on. Sing another verse, but
good to be, good to be here and appreciate you listening. We'll meet again this evening at 6 o'clock for the evening service. I'd like to invite you to come back, and Wednesday night we meet at 7 o'clock for a prayer meeting. I have every intention of being here Wednesday night, but I'll be in Nashville Wednesday morning, so I'll, whenever they let me out of the hospital, I don't know. If the doctor doesn't show up till 6 or 7 o'clock that evening, and it takes about three hours to get here, so I doubt if I'll be here in time. But if he comes by early that morning and gets me out of there, well, I'll be here Wednesday night. So I plan to be here. That's one thing that's out of my control. I don't, I don't walk